Tencent aren't just moving into the West through Epic Games. This week, they have launched their own Western store. We then have big news from the big three and the ludicrously effective Apex banning process that may become the standard. It's another busy week and hell, this is supposed to be the quiet time of the year. So let's get into it. Hey everyone and welcome to the first of this week's Roundups, the show where we bring you all the industry news that you need to know in one place. We have a major announcement very soon on this channel, but you can actually watch it early through the link down below in the description. Suffice to say, this channel is going to do so much more. It's going to be so much bigger. We're launching a new show and there's far more past that and we're going to build it together. So to learn more, check out that link. Okay. The Epic Store situation. First, we have an update from the CEO of Epic that's worth mentioning here because it does somewhat change a previous company statement. So back in GDC, when talking about the Metro Exodus situation, Epic said that they did not want something like that to happen again. Of course, that was referring to the situation where the, um, well, the broken Steam promise of Metro Exodus, uh, even though Steam pre-orders were up, of course, the game then went into exclusivity and the dev took a lot of flack. Well, most of us took that as saying they wouldn't do that again, and we took that as a good thing. Turns out that's not the case. Tim Sweeney tweeted that they have since had internal discussions and that Epic will continue to sign funding and exclusivity deals with developers and publishers regardless of their prior plans or announcements around Steam. So there you go. Epic said they would not do that. They have since changed their mind. They will continue to do that. No doubt something that will not win them friends in the gaming community. It really does seem like their bullishness is rather, I would say, spreadsheet informed. They essentially know the negative feedback that they're getting, but they clearly don't care. They just seem to be content to sit back, look at their spreadsheets, watch the numbers roll in and make their decisions based off that. And you know, sometimes that can work, but from the perspective of somebody who is also a World of Warcraft YouTuber, Man, I'm really sick of stuff being designed by spreadsheets. I think there is a community element that is lost, and that is the very community element that could get them in the good books of core PC gamers, who I think fundamentally do want to support developers. Sadly though, they've chosen to, you know, do things the way that they have done. I think they might see themselves more as market expanders though, trying to bring their casual Fortnite audience over to the core. I think that might be what they want to do. It's certainly an odd time and no doubt there'll be a lot more to follow. Of course, one thing that people have been very critical of Epic Games for is that uh, Chinese tech company Tencent has a 40% stake in the company. Well, that seemingly is not stopping Tencent from rolling out their own gaming platform into the West. So over in China, Wii Game is a game launcher and storefront. It's massive. It's got over 200 million users. They are now launching that into the West in the form of Wii Game X, which is currently in early access form, with there only being 17 games so far. However, Larian, the developers of Divinity Original Sin, Deep Silver, the publisher, and Hello Games, the developers of No Man's Sky, are all there listed under the famous IP section of their teaser website. So they're going to be launching with genre tags, cloud saves, limited offline mode, and user reviews. So I guess that's at least two features that Steam or that um, Epic doesn't have. Now, they launched it alongside an extensive privacy policy in English, so clearly they know that people have uh, some trust concerns there. And overall, it's interesting, you know, in spite of the government uh, ties that uh, Tencent have, both them and NetEase recently actually struggled to get a lot of games approved. That actually led to Tencent having pretty rocky stock performance, which if anything, just shows that I need to do more research into the Chinese game market and how all of that works before I can really say more about it. But will this provide competition to Epic or Steam? I mean, technically it would, it's another storefront, but I don't see it really having wide acceptance. Indeed, I don't see it doing that well overall, at least from, you know, over, over here. Like from, from what I understand, WeChat is actually beginning to make inroads in the West, though I think that's just a very different set of circumstances to Wii game. The best way that they compete, I guess, is with Chinese games, like being exclusives. Uh, but right now, I think a lot of those games aren't known and typically have followed business models that Western audiences are not particularly accepting of. So I doubt they're expecting a quick success here. I think this is likely a part of like a 10 year plan for the company. Um, in my view, I don't think the established storefronts are going to feel that worried. And as for users' concerns over exclusivity, well, 
they just seem to be naming famous IP like No Man's Sky, Larian, etc. Really just to say, hey everyone, we have Western games that you recognize over on our store. So far, they've not talked about exclusivity. It doesn't, I mean, we, we don't know if that's part of their plan or not. That will certainly be something that colors how people react to this, although I do imagine that most people will be, by default, a little bit suspicious. Next up, we've got the Apex Legends hacking situation. Of course, hackers arrived in Apex. That makes a lot of sense. It always happens with big new games. What's newsworthy, though, is the length to which Respawn have went to shut down those hackers. Normally, you just have your account banned, and for a free-to-play game, well, that's not really a problem. You can just make another one. Often, though, you'll be IP banned. That would mean that you would have to play through a VPN afterwards to change your IP, which uh, would be a bit of an annoyance. Well, Apex have taken things quite a bit further. They're actually banning people based on hardware ID. Essentially, they generate an ID for your computer based off its hardware, um, that will be sort of tied to your account, and that essentially gives them uh, enough to know. It gives them essentially an index of computers. So even if you're using a VPN, they could know, oh, that computer was used for hacking. Therefore, they will automatically ban any new accounts originating from that hardware ID. Now, whatever they're doing here has got to be nifty. So far, I have not heard of widespread false positives, and it clearly is resistant to basic countermeasures. Now, sure, swapping your CPU or your motherboard might do the trick, but it's hard to know. I mean, what, do they know the serial number of your CPU? Is it based off that? I've got no idea how they're actually accessing a lot of this stuff without, like, getting user permissions or whatever, but whatever it is, it certainly is a hardcore anti-cheating measure that seems to be extremely effective. I do think it's a good thing overall. Battle Royales are ruined by cheating, I think far more than many different genres because of the high impact of death. Normally the price of entry to a game deters people, well, deters hackers from being that persistent, but, uh, or well, I guess just have them use hacked accounts. But overall, it is more of a problem on free-to-play games that damages the experience a lot. And it's definitely one thing that I think has driven a lot of people away from, say, uh, playing PUBG. Now, given this system's effectiveness, I have to wonder if we're going to see this be used more. Indeed, I'm actually kind of surprised that a middleware company hasn't appeared to handle banning in this manner. I mean, maybe that's something that does exist and I don't know, but whatever it is, it seems like this is a very effective method. Next, we have a rumor reported by a German website called Xbox Dynasty. Now, this one's a little bit wild, with their report claiming a 500 million budget for Halo Infinite coming from a podcast where one of the co-hosts uh, was at GDC and said that's what they heard. Is this true? Is it false? It's very hard to know. 500 million purely on dev costs seems insane to me. It really, that seems like a development plus marketing number to me, but even with that, it's obviously massive. Now, if we were to entertain the notion of Infinite having such an absurdly large budget, you sort of can see how it makes sense. Microsoft lost a lot more than $500 million to Sony when, uh, well, because of the underperformance they had during this console cycle, seemingly selling half the number of consoles that Sony did, which of course is more important now than ever because of, you know, recurring store and subscription revenue and how they are tied to consoles. Now, Halo 5 was funded by Microsoft during the famous, you know, television sports connect time, and it didn't really end up acting as a system seller. Well, I think it would make sense for them to put a massive amount of resources into Halo Infinite and have it release within a year of launch. It's very true that the Reclaimer series of Halo 4 and Halo 5 just has not had the impact of the, the first three games. I suppose a lot of that has just been having, in many times, actually fantastic video games, but I suppose a bit of a muddled direction. Microsoft going super hard into the next Halo could give the next Xbox the momentum it would need to prevent a repeat of the last console generation sales figures, especially given the early start the PS4, well, the very strong start even that the PS4 had over them. Certainly, it's, it's going to be interesting. I think to me, it's interesting given Microsoft's recent willingness to innovate on business model, having things like Game Pass, expanding more onto PC. They really seem to be trying to be a more dynamic and modern company that's trying to be in line with how consumers actually want to use their software. It certainly is becoming less obtuse and archaic, which, uh, yeah, as I said, pretty much is a good thing. Next up, we've got a quick one from Sony. They have actually updated their refund policy, but it's still fairly silly. So you now can get a refund on digital goods, but only if you don't download them. And that's pretty strange. It basically only uh, protects from accidental purchases, clearly showing that Sony really view the likes of, say, Steam's refund policy as being there for hardware testing, something that shouldn't be needed on a PS4. 
I mean, I say that, but we all remember the Anthem crashes, and indeed, we know that many games do launch on consoles with what I would call poor performance that is worthy of a refund being initiated. Really, I think Sony should at least implement a two-hour timer for the majority of their games. I think that would make a lot of sense. But next though, and not to leave any of the big three out, it's worth noting that Nintendo were just ranked the ninth most reputable business in the USA. Now that's something you're not going to see from EA or Activision Blizzard anytime soon. And overall, I just wanted to mention it because I think it shows how much people are appreciating the way in which Nintendo does business and treats them as customers. They have pretty reasonable microtransactions and DLC for the most part. They have great games. They have a much loved console. They were pretty innovative with their corporate communications being years ahead of other companies with Nintendo Direct. And that's something that's allowed them to develop a far stronger relationship with their customers. I'd say stronger than just about any other major company in gaming. Overall, they've been doing well, and it's nice to see those practices actually be recognized and um, rewarded. Next, and really in the trend of retail dying, GameSpot posted a annual loss of $673 million. That's pretty insane, and it's down to pre-owned struggling, falling by 12%, while new game sales fell by only 4%, and hardware sales were flat. Pre-owned is quite a strange thing. It's actually useful for customers. It's incredible for retailers, but it's really, really, really bad for publishers. Indeed, pre-owned physical games are one of the reasons why publishers are less willing to make games like Uncharted. You know, person A buys the game for $60, the publisher maybe gets 35 of those dollars. They then sell it back to GameStop, and then GameStop sells it to someone else, rinse and repeat that a few times, and suddenly maybe four people have played the full game but the publisher has only earned $32, $35, and GameSpot has earned far more. Personally, I don't actually like that, and it's why I've never personally supported pre-owned games. I do really see it as being a middleman that kind of adds no value, just getting a lot of the money. I mean, whether a game is pirated or pre-owned, as a sale, it actually means the same to the people who funded the game's existence. Nothing. Of course, I totally understand why it's an extremely convenient thing for customers, how it does add more value to purchase, and is especially good for, you know, sort of lower income situations where the ability to sell your game back and then get a new game is extremely important. So I'm definitely not, you know, swiping that under the rug or anything. I suppose why I find it interesting is that it just shows an imbalance of incentives within the industry. Now, as digital rises, pre-owned is beginning to fall. And really, if you look at, say, Microsoft's rumored digital-only Xbox, I mean, that does seem like a way to cut into retail from my perspective. In many ways, games at retail is a little bit archaic given modern technology. From an economic efficiency perspective anyway, it's remarkably inefficient. There are so many middlemen between the customer and the publisher, and that does mean that more and more of the money goes, or that we spend in games, goes to retailers and distributors and not the people who actually made them. But still, being real, it's hard to shed a tear for AAA, and it's not like on digital we see those cost savings get passed down to us. And I think that is the, like, the fundamental thing here. If, say, Microsoft, would sell their games for maybe a little bit less money on their own store to sort of make up for that, then for the consumer, it's like, okay, this is convenient. I don't need to leave my house. I don't need to wait for shipping. Uh, more of the money that I put into this game will go to the people who actually funded and created the game. And because there's less of a middleman, oh, the game company are giving me a bit of a discount versus retail. That seems like a great thing to do. But they're not doing that, are they? Indeed, when we look at digital, we normally see that games are more expensive. Why? Because, well, I mean, Microsoft have the stranglehold on the Microsoft Store. So, as much as I may say I don't particularly like the middlemen nature of pre-owned game sales, it's not like the alternative is a great, rosy, perfect future where the creators get more money and we get cheaper games. I think that clearly isn't the case. And really, when we look at, say, the rise of game subscription services like Origin Access and Game Pass, to me, they seem like pretty clear moves against pre-owned, especially for the console market, because, of course, pre-owned has essentially never really existed in PC, um, or at least over the last 20 years because of, you know, license keys and the like. Um, so it really is something that the PC audience won't be as used to as the console audience. Still, it's interesting to see the continual retail slump. I think once more, it's just that as time goes on, we see things that we were used to shift and change. Publishers are going to have more control over the release of their games, and they're going to see fewer middlemen eat into their revenue. In an ideal world, it would be a great thing. More money to creators, a better deal for customers, more convenience. 
but it often is not an ideal world, as I said, so I find it very hard to feel like this is a victory, like those cost savings would end up being passed down to consumers. I think that's, well, just not going to happen, and realistically, you know, the only people who would really be hurt super hard by, you know, pre-owned and the kind of retail cuts would be indies, and guess what? Indies have never really had a big presence at retail anyway, so, I mean, yeah. There are some things that retail do that are pretty annoying, though. I guess less of that will happen, but I, I guess, yeah, we just are moving into this more highly efficient digital sort of model where publishers have more control over the release of their games, and sometimes that can be a good thing, but sometimes it, can, you know, it isn't a good thing. We see things like the bizarre staggered release dates, we see the digital does not lead to a decrease in price, and really a lot of stuff like that, which I think does make people kind of suspicious of the publishers, because we, we just sort of see, well, you guys are now getting a better deal, and that's not being passed down to us, and that doesn't really feel great. I mean, a lot of the business side of it is very understandable, but at the end of the day, that's one concern. The thing that probably matters more is the concerns of customers, and it, you know, obviously is not always in line with that. So there you go, that is today's news roundup. Now, hit all that link down in the description. Yes, we are launching a new Patreon. We want to hire on two more staff. We are starting a new series today. We want to launch more series over time. Game reviews, game impressions. Eventually, I want to get onto longer form documentaries. This channel, I want to be a real, a new thing a hub for just new innovative content that, you know, grew first on YouTube and is, it just, you know, works with just how we all actually experience games and, you know, isn't a holdover from the old sort of, you know, game website days or whatever. So that's really what I want to try to do with this. Create a YouTube first, born and bred kind of gaming institution. And uh, I mean, hey, today's the very start of that. We'll see how it all goes, but we're all pretty darn excited. So thank you very much for watching this video. And with that, I'll see you next time.